My name's Matt, welcome back to the shop. And today we're going to be talking about uh, dimples. And uh, not the ass cheek ones, the uh, <laughs> the golf ball ones that belong on golf balls but don't belong inside pots. So, um, this is a picture I saw recently. You see these now and then, they, they do the rounds. I've seen them on pistons, cylinders, valve, back of valves. I've seen them on all sorts of stuff. And, <sighs> yeah. So, there's, these people will argue backwards and forwards that this is they see improvements. People do not generally know how to um, differentiate the difference between an improvement and just test variability. But regardless, if it makes them happy and all that, makes them sleep better at night. So what? So let's talk about actually what, um, why this doesn't work. Right, why this doesn't work and why this isn't done in mass manufacturing. It'd be easy to do in mass manufacturing, just like it's easy to do uh, to make dimples in golf balls. It would be easy to cast these into cylinder heads, but they don't because, well, you'll find out why. So what we need to do is we need to fully understand, we kind of got a good grasp on this, what this is, right? It's a port, it's a hull, right? It's a hull that air passes down, it's like a... Uh, Hose pipe, it's like any kind of piping or tubing, it's a hole, right? So, let's have a look at what a golf ball is dimpled for, and so on. So, the very quickly we'll go through the, the absolute, how did this come about? Very quick story, it's usually repeated quite a lot of times. Guys back in the day playing golf, I know they need to get a life, but you know, people, people are strange. So... <laughs> Um, they play golf, and I imagine that this is what happened, is that you whack a ball, and it goes as far as the ball goes. And then you use this ball until, um, it, you know, it's pretty gnarly. And you're probably thinking to yourself, oh, you know, this ball's pretty gnarly, it's probably crap. So you chuck a new ball down, and you whack that same ball, and you go, hang about, have I all of a sudden just become a limp-wristed little girl or something? So you whack a couple of more times, you know, you, you go around the course, because obviously it's quite repetitive. You whack it quite a few times, and then you realise that, the, hang about, am I going mad? Give me a minute. So you put your other ball down, or maybe you're practising, maybe you're a driving range, and you whack your old ball, and all of a sudden your skills come back. So then you put your new ball down, you give that a whack, and not, it reverts back to you're a little sissy girl. So you... <laughs> you carry on doing it again and again and again until you realise that the knackered old ball that's got scars in it and scratches and all this other works better. It flies further, you know, for your because you're trying to you know you're trying to drive this just as far as you can. So you know that your power output is pretty consistent and ish. You know what I mean? You, you, you've got a limit. Right? You're not all of a sudden going to be five times more powerful. You know, more powerful swing. So then you, you get a new ball, you rough it up, and then all of a sudden your skills come back again. So you've artificially um, roughed up the surface. So nowadays, um, you know, since the 1930s onwards, they dimpled golf balls to artificially create what this phenomenon was. But the thing is, no one at the time actually knew what was go really going on. So let's talk about what's going on. So the ball, and this is going to be a load of arrow pointing and all sorts of stuff, so the ball is wanting to go this way. Now we're going to talk about very briefly a non-rotating ball. Right? So we're not going to worry about lift and all the rest of it. We're not going to talk about deflected wakes and so on and so on and lifting bodies and you know all that jazz. So what we have instead, oops, I forgot I still got that selected. Our ball's going that way, right? So this is, in a sense, the momentum the ball has. It's its velocity and its mass, right? So we'll just, that big, massive arrow. Then what we've got is we've got air that we collide with. Now, the air's, veloc uh, the air's velocity is in that direction, 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 that direction. In the 3D world, it's everywhere, right? Um, because it's just air and it sits there and bobs along at a good 500 meters per second, blah, 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 blah. 
But we can basically call that nil, right? We can just get all of those averages and just say that the air is still, right? So the ball is plowing into the air. Now, we can then say, well, the opposite. The ball plowing into the air is the same as the air plowing into a ball. And that's how you do a lot of aerodynamic testing. You keep whatever you've got still and you plow air into it. As far as vectors and uh, magnitudes and all this, they are the same. Right. There's no distinguishing the difference, really, apart from, you know, locality. So we can look at this in, you know, that kind of way. So what happens is, is some air comes along, right, and it goes like this, and it hits and it bounces off. Right, so you get this going on. It hits this surface, and obviously I'm not touching the surface, but it bounces off. Right, And when it does that, it applies a tiny bit of force in the opposite direction the ball is going. So you basically get this and nibble this out of this. As this increasingly happens, the ball starts to slow down. We call this form drag, right? I'm sure, you know, everyone's familiar with that. But what happens is, is that you have some more air that comes in here and hits this one. And it's a bang. And they collide. This ricochets off. Actually, let's use a, a better colour so we can just see. I'm trying to keep them like red-ish in that red scheme. There we go. That ricochets off like that. And then this red one comes in and it bounces off like this. So as you can see, we can... And that hits there like that, you know. And then this bounces off again. And then another molecule of air comes in and intersects it like this and that bounces off like that and you can see where we're going here so what happens is is that you can see how air flows around the ball it's not just the incoming and obviously there is air that is coming in you know brand new air and hitting the and but we just get too noisy with arrows so what's happening is is if you have a smooth ball have you noticed that I've hit in all the dimples? If you go back and you have a smooth ball, what happens is, is that you can have an arrow come in, hit there like that, do the same thing. And then let's just say our red arrow, our particle here, hits this smooth ball. Well, what happens is you kind of get this. It just glances off band. It might collide with the air, but there isn't this massive impact deflection thing going on. Now, what happens in this situation here is this air has lost a bit of momentum, but then it kind of gains it back to a degree from another molecule of air. It smashes into this, and this is increases it. So you can kind of, if we go right back, you could exaggerate this, because obviously this is just for demonstration purposes. Let's just say the size of the arrow is the, vo the, 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 the velocity this has. So now it's hit there. It's imparted that much to there. So we've this and this equal this big long red arrow. But then this bad boy comes in, smashes it. It's just as long as this one. So this one gains a bit. All right? So it gets a bit longer. Its magnitude is greater. Or what we could do is we could even make them fatter. Actually, that's probably not a bad idea. So, if we say we're going to come in like this, you get the idea, but we're going to come in like this, and we're going to call this that fat. And then it dumps a bit into here, but that's a lot smaller. You know what I mean? We lose, we lose a little bit like that. So then this arrow isn't 28 or whatever. It's um, just say 20. It's like that. And then this fat hungus comes in like this at 28. I'll just say 30. We'll just say 30. Like that. That's fatter. And then this just gains. It's not going to be it's not going to be 30, but it's going to be 25. Then you get what I mean, right? So you, you gain some momentum, right? It's just conservation of momentum. So what happens is is that this this air that's bouncing around the skin of the ball, this boundary layer, is kind of picking up momentum from the air around it because it's been flung, there's turbulence, right? It's been it's been mixed in, that's what's going on. It's been mixed in with the air around it, which means 
if the air is traveling slow, right, it can't, the ball is traveling really fast or the air is traveling as a flow flat fast. What happens is, is as you get round to the back, if you're traveling too slow, the ball has moved. So that's probably a best way to basically signify that. If you're going too slow, the ball has moved too much by the time you're trying to make it behind the ball. So what that does is that increases this void behind the ball. Right? Great. Oh no, actually cancel that, keep it. So that's what's happening here. This is this separation point. Right? So what's the difference between the smooth ball here and the rough ball is that this boundary layer effect that's going on, where there's these little swirls, you know, turbulence and eddy currents and all the rest and vortices and so on. All of these that's going around here um, is mixing in fresh air, instead of just flowing over the top of each other, they're mixing in there, which means that you maintain a higher velocity at the skin of the ball. Because you've all seen the, um, let's see if we can find a picture, the velocity through a, through a pipe, right? You can, um, velocity through pipe. You, know, you look at this, the streamlines through a pipe. So you kind of like see this. You yeah, had the laminar flow and the turbulent flow. Right? So you have this where it's flowing faster in the middle, but towards the edge you get stagnation eventually. So you get all this kind of gubbins. Right? Now, if you actually look at these, they actually favour laminar flow through a pipe because... It's kind. It's trying to be unidirectional. Right? You're all trying to go all in the same direction. You you want laminar flow. Introducing turbulence to this, as everybody knows, is a bad thing. That's why you would chamfer your valve guides or try and remove gnarly bits. You know what I mean? Because they induce turbulence. Right. So you can see where I'm going with this. Right. These are two different effects. This is the problem. This is what some people don't seem to understand. It's because they don't understand this principle. What's happening here is that we are trying to reduce this wake. The reason why is because this is a void. And what that means is that, you know, people say suction. They shouldn't say suction. It's really annoying when they say that. Uh, oops. What's going on is that you have... The momentum of the ball, right, the, or in other words, the you could say the energy in the ball is going this way. You have obviously loads of form drag, which is basically the fact that the ball has to, because that's where these lines don't make any sense. They, they, they don't just separate, right? Um, you are literally, this is this is a, 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 bound, a cone of mess in here. So there's basically the drag of just hitting this. Now, if you have a void around the back, right, there is no pressure, like just say atmospheric pressure, pushing on this ball. You know what I mean? Ooh, why is my line going funny? There is no atmospheric pressure pushing the back of the ball. If anything, there's nothing, right? This, this, this is void. There's nothing there. So that means that the forces that are involved are there's nothing here. You know, if we can just do that, we'll just say it's like an X. It's voided here, right? You've got this big wake behind you. There's nothing hitting the back of the ball. That's what the people like to say when they say suction. Otherwise, there's pressure here. There's no pressure behind the ball. So if you have a ball just sat on a table, there is pressure pushing from the below, from from below, from above, from the left, the right, the sides. You know what I mean? Pressure's pushing in every single direction. If you have a ball moving this way and it has a wake of nothing behind it right there's, there's there's nothing pushing the ball you know from this side so in a sense this just becomes greater so if you can reduce the size of this wake if you can have in a sense anything from the halfway point if any air is hitting this ball through the center towards you know the, in other words if anything's hitting the ball that way Air, you know, air pressure, air molecules bouncing, they're pushing that way beyond the halfway point. 
then they are f helping the ball go forward. You know what I mean? Or in other words, countering this. You know what I mean? The chip. So even if you're doing that, if you're hitting that way, there is a forward component to that. And that forward component is helping, helping in a sense, balance out this. In other words, making this less of an effect, the drag. Right, so it this is what I mean by reducing drag. If you have air that's just applying any kind of momentum to the back, right, it is going to reduce the drag force because that's what you got to think of. When people say things are reducing drag, right, some people think, oh, it, it's stopping the amount of hair, air hitting the ball. It's like, no, no, no. Drag is a force. It's an opposing force to the way you want to go. So you, you should always, in a sense, when you hear the word drag, think drag force. This is why people are a bit confused by aerody aerodynamics, because they'll say, well, if this is reducing drag, surely the air is still hitting. The so in other words, how can dimples reduce drag? Surely putting a nose cone on the ball, if you get what I mean, would be better. Uh, how come just the surface? And this is why people don't understand it. What you are trying to do is you are trying to reduce, as you can see from this picture, you're trying to reduce the size of the wick. And the separation point there is basically when the, when the air, this boundary layer effect, leaves the surface of the ball. So in other words, for the top one here, if I just get rid of the arrow, like so, and we get a smaller line. This one would be more like it has a, you know, something like this, a, a, a cone of really low pressure there, where on this side you would have, a, a, you know, something more akin to, well, it could be absolutely huge, you know, it could be something like this, right? So this is a really low pressure region. And basically what it means is this surface area here isn't basically, has got hardly any molecules hitting against it compared to everywhere else. And here you've got, you know, you, you've, you've regained some of that back. So this is why the balls fly further, because you put the same energy in, but you've reduced the drag force, the force that's trying to slow the ball down by X amount because of this, turb this turbulent boundary layer that you've created. So when we go to then look at um, engines, right, when we go to look up these ports, we then have to think to ourselves, well, are we doing the same thing? Oops, I'm pressing the wrong thing. So, the way that the ball flies further is not because you've made the ball slippy, it's because you've used the air that's already around you to reduce the drag force. So the thing that is slowing the ball down. The ball goes faster not the air, the ball goes faster because it's losing less energy per unit time, right? This is a cross-section of the H2R engine. It's, you know, one of the, 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 the it, it's the pinnacle of normal combustion engines without any weird stuff, like Formula One just say. So you can see here that our port, so this is our uh, throttle body. You can see the throttle plate there. You can see the injector there, and it's coming down into here. As you can see, from the th this, the, the the throttle plate is a restrictor. It's literally what its job is to do. It's to restrict air, and then it's there. When you go full throttle, it's hopefully providing very little restriction. When this opens, the air floods into here, right? And we're hoping for laminar flow, and it goes straight in. Oh. There's a tiny little bend there, a tiny little radius there, but we're going straight in, right? And the other problem is there's a giant big bloody valve in your way. When the, even when the valve is open, you've got to sneak around the valve, and this is quite a tight radius here, right? But as you can see, there is no... We're not trying to um, drag anything, right? We are not trying... With a golf ball, we are not trying to speed up the airflow around the ball because the air is still and the ball is going through the air. What we are trying to do is we're trying to make sure by a, a surface texture that the air is flowing round the ball more completely. That's not what this is. That's not what this is. And they've spent so much money on this engine that they would dimple the crap out of this if it had any benefit, because this is literally a pinnacle bike. This is a pinnacle engine. This is getting into the realms of 
motor GP and, and, and Formula One kind of type engines. It's getting in the realms, for, especially for mass produced. So, this is the whole point, right? Is that you, you, you're not trying to mitigate the drag, right? Because we're not trying to reduce how slippy the surface is. You know what I mean? We're not trying to make the coefficient of friction, just say, or the form drag, or the skin drag of the ports, or a golf ball. We're not trying to make it slippier. What we are trying to do is we're trying to mitigate or reduce the amount of force against the ball by trying to equalise it out by regaining some of the pressure that's now missing in the wake of the ball. Right? That's what we're trying to do. That isn't this. The air flowing through this, if you have dimples, is not going to speed up. or do, If anything, it's going to slow down right? because you're creating turbulent flow. Now, there are people that say, ah, but you're missing the point here. What we're trying to do is we ha we have fueling problems, right? So let me just I'll show you I'll show you the problem with what people say. I'll explain it a bit better than that, and then um, so we'll we'll put this picture in. Yeah, whatever. Uh, we'll put this picture in. Oops, oops. Oh, for God's sake, give me one second. Copy that image, and then. Paste it. There we go. Right, so people say, oh, well, no, what we have is we have fuel um, that's in, in the port still, right? So let's just say that we put into the engine. Um, let's just say we go like this. For every one, two, three, four, five... Balls of fuel, right? We put it fuel air we put into the engine. One of those, right? One of those gets wetted on the port, yeah, because of the surface. And if we have dimples, it mixes, right? So you've got this situation going on, and what they what they what they're talking about is that. A bit of air, a bit of the fuel evaporates into the flow, and the flow picks it up and takes it into the port. Let's just say that's a thing. So let's just say we put five molecules of fuel into the cylinder, but because of the port wetting, just say one of them gets left behind. So now we've got four in here, right? Cool. I get it. So then the next intake stroke happens, right? And we have another five go in but one gets left behind and then we've got another four in here and it burns and everything seems normal yeah and then the next time another port like this and then we've got another four in there great and you can see what's what i'm getting at here right is that eventually what's going to happen is that the port is going to become saturated in fuel and the engine is going to leak out it's going to choke out because it's too rich does this happen no, it doesn't. It doesn't happen. It just, it doesn't happen. Let's just say you were right. right? Let's just say five units of fuel go in, but one gets stuck to the port, and then this happens. Right? Then what happens is, is you spray some more fuel into your cylinder, right? and this one goes in, and then it gets replaced by the next injection event, that one, and then we've got another four here like this, right? It's like wonderful. I get it. And then after that, the same thing happens again. Is that whatever's in here ends up going into the cylinder, maybe on the next stroke. You don't get a saturated port where it's just wet, and when the port opens, it just pisses fuel in. In other words, as the engine revs, even at idle, it's not getting richer and richer and richer and richer. This is nonsense. Stop talking nonsense. Right? The the golf balls aren't helping you make sure you get all of your fuel for every single stroke. Because if there is any residue, let's just say there's 1% left over in the port. If it didn't get, you know, if it didn't, if it wasn't this conveyor belt of the port's a bit wet, that eventually makes its way into the cylinder and it wets the port again. If this didn't happen, then you would have an accumulation over time. 
and people run out engines for hours. Yeah, you imagine that you just oh no, <laughs> and then it's basically just this is a port full of liquid in your hydrolock your engine, right? Or it just gets so rich as you ride along. No, it doesn't. It's nonsense. People are talking crap, right? Your port is not a golf ball. These dimples are to reduce the drag forces by reducing the flow separation around the ball, right? Because the ball is moving through the air or the air is flowing around the ball, whichever. The difference is as well with a golf ball is that the golf ball is the, in a sense, this is an external airflow. This is the ball. This is the rest of the bloody universe. With a port, it's the other way around, right? A port is a, con it's a constricted passage. The air goes in one end and comes out the other. Now, how it comes out of there, how turbulent that is, or how lam laminar that is, is that's how well it flows through it. If you put a nice 140 degree bend in there, you're going to slow the crap out of it. The fact of the matter is, that's about flow, and we want laminar flow if we can get it, not turbulent flow. This is inducing turbulence. The only reason why you'd want dimples is if you had an engine that had poor fuel mixing because you had carbs and you could still tune that properly. You don't need to dimple your cylinder walls. It's just daft. All you are doing, in a sense, is increasing the surface area of the port walls, which would induce turbulence. Stop doing it. Right? Like I say, the best engines in the world don't do it. There's a reason why they don't do it. They can quite easily do it. If you think that they can't do something like this, you're stoned. Right? This is a waste of time. If anyone tells you you should be doing this or anyone tells you anything, it's complete crap. Don't do it. It's nonsense. <laughs> Hope that makes sense. And I'll see you in a bit.